I started out going to the gym on the weekends with my dad 15 years ago. And since then, I emulated a 1,200 pound powerlifting total. I've won multiple very large shows in an eight state region for bodybuilding, earned my purple belt in Jiu Jitsu, became a certified personal trainer, and built my career in software engineering from scratch. And I firmly believe that all of the success I have in life, I really owe to starting out going to the gym on those weekends with my dad 15 years ago. We're gonna talk about 15 things that I wish I would have known when I got started. These things have helped me make more progress faster, avoid burnout and injury, and most importantly, helped me cultivate a healthier mindset as a whole. Hopefully, you hearing these allows you to skip some of the road bumps that I hit along the way and allows you to get to your goals faster. Now, as we go through these, if any of these lessons are things that you've learned or that you wish you would have known, make sure you let me know in the comments below. Let's get into it. Number one, fitness will always be the most perfect metaphor for the rest of your life. Now, when you start lifting, you go through this phase called newbie gains. This is when your body is rapidly adapting to the new stimuli that you're providing. This period of time is extraordinarily exciting. Then, in an all but perfect mirror of the Dunning-Kruger effect, you hit a peak and crash. This is how everything in life works though. What you can't see is that when you hit this trough, this low point after so many highs relatively easily attained, this is the moment where you're actually laying the foundation for enjoying the thing for what it truly is, not for what you think the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow might possibly be. Now, if you, like me, have a history of chronically abandoning different things in your life after that period of newbie gains wears off, you're robbing yourself of the most important part of the experience. Everything that you want in life and everything worth having in life is on the other side of remaining at least fairly consistent with things that are somewhat difficult over a prolonged period of time. And so learning how to persist through that desire to quit or throw in the towel is going to go really far. And if you can learn how to do this in the gym or on the track or on the mats or whatever you decide to pursue for fitness, you'll be training the parts of your mind and body required to succeed at sticking through the tough stuff later in life. Number two, chase feelings, not outcomes. Almost all of us start working out because we want a particular outcome. We want a six pack, we want to bench three wheels, we want bigger arms, we want to be able to deadlift 500 pounds. Don't get me wrong, we need goals. Having a North Star, especially in today's world that feels progressively more and more devoid of meaning, acts as a North Star to direct us on where we need to go next. But let me explain where this falls over. Let's say your goal is to have a six pack. Depending on your starting point, this is gonna take months or years. There's no way around that. A six pack is the result of making the same choices day in and day out over a prolonged period of time. And guess what happens when you get the six pack? Absolutely nothing. If you want to keep the six pack, all of those trade-offs and all of that effort that you applied over the last several months to years to get there, the same effort and attention you're going to have to pay to continue to maintain the six pack. For as long as you're only set on chasing these outcomes though, you'll be perpetually disappointed upon arriving at them because they in and of themselves don't actually change anything. However, if you decide to approach designing your life around feelings and then setting outcome-based goals on top of the feelings, you'll be able to enjoy each step along the way that creates that feeling for you. Going to the gym each day becomes the thing that allows you to feel strong and sexy and consistent and disciplined and all of the things that you're hoping you get at the end when you have the six pack. And as long as you're enjoying the steps you're taking along the way, the outcome that you set forth of having the six pack becomes an inevitable extension of making the same choices that are, for all intents and purposes, relatively easy to. Number three, action proceeds motivation, not the other way around. Most of the time we all think that we need to get motivated in order to do something. That motivation is some sort of magic pill that we can swallow and will allow us to climb any wall that's placed in front of us. And until we take that magic pill, until motivation suddenly arrives upon us, we're completely powerless. We can't take any action. The reality is that motivation is actually an extraordinarily fickle and limited resource. And it's typically only renewed if we take action first in the direction that we want to go. The only thing that motivation and willpower are useful for is taking the very first step. Now, if I put my James Clear hat on for a second, if you don't feel like going to the gym, rewind that back and think about what the very first thing you need to do in order to get to the gym is. Put on your gym clothes. Next, put on your gym shoes. Get in the car. Drive to the gym. No matter how much your brain is screaming at you that you don't feel like it, you can do all of these smaller incremental steps. And before you know it, by the time you get to the gym and you're doing your first rep of your first set, that's 
switch will be fully switched on and motivation will just kind of happen. Motivation is a byproduct of momentum and action, not the thing that creates momentum and action. Number four, liking something and wanting something are not the same thing. Most of us want to be healthier and look fitter and be more attractive or be stronger. Most of us, at least at first, don't like the actions required to get to that end state. Something that I learned only very recently is actually the circuitry of our brain that controls our wanting of a thing and our liking of a thing are completely different. And we often, until Daddy Huberman entered the scene, incorrectly assigned dopamine as the molecule that determines enjoyment. That's actually not quite right. Dopamine is the molecule of pursuit. It's what we get as a reward after completing a particular set of behaviors or actions. It's what inspires us to go after things. Enjoying or liking something, though, is actually controlled by our hedonic circuitry, which creates neurotransmitters of GABA and opiates. And that's why when we drink alcohol or take drugs, things that we might not normally enjoy as much become much more enjoyable because both of these facilitate the production of both of these neurotransmitters in huge amounts. Then there's this other process in our brain called prediction error reward processing, which basically means that even though that we know we enjoy fitness and by the time we start working out, it's a lot of fun and then afterwards we feel super fulfilled and rewarded, our brains will almost never accurately predict that before we get started. They will almost always tell us, ew, I don't want to do that. And we're not going to want to do these things and we're not going to like doing them until we actually get started on doing them. It really doesn't matter how much we know we'll feel incredible during and afterwards and that we'll be reinvigorated and ready to attack the day. We're still not gonna wanna do it again tomorrow. And so when it comes to doing things that we don't want to do, these two parts of our brain will never be in sync. That might sound frustrating and in some ways it is, but when I heard it put this way, I think it encapsulates all of this and it gives you a solution to move forward with. Let go of looking for this magical thing called motivation See, previous point. I am 100% sure this will be good for me and I am 100% sure I'm not gonna want to do it. And that's okay, I can still choose to do it anyway. Number five, everything is a trade-off. Look, we all want to be able to have our cake and eat it too. That sounds incredible. But the brass tacks of the situation is that there is always going to be a trade-off. But that trade-off isn't inherently a bad thing. I'll explain that. An example I heard from Dr. K on Healthy Gamer once was, if I enjoy or feel more fulfilled by writing my book or working towards writing my book than I feel through playing video games, is it really a sacrifice or a trade-off for me to work on my book instead of playing video games? Of course not. It's only a sacrifice or a negative trade-off if we feel as though the thing we are choosing to pursue is not as valuable as the alternative behavior presented to us. Is it a sacrifice to go to the gym instead of going to the club? Maybe. It depends on how you view those two choices. Is it a sacrifice to eat the higher protein meal instead of the croissant? Maybe. Just depends on how you view those two choices. And guess what? You don't have to make either choice 100% of the time. Some days you're going to want to go to the club with your friends or stay out late and suffer the consequences of a hangover or a bad night's sleep, and that will feel more worth it to you than the suffering induced by soreness from a really brutal leg day. Sometimes the opposite will be true. Neither is right and neither is wrong. It's just a trade-off, and only you can decide in any given moment which trade-off is better for you. Number six, you can always do more tomorrow, but you cannot undo doing too much today. Do you remember when Couch to 5K was a thing? And if you've never heard of this, and I just dated myself as a millennial dinosaur, <laughs> Let me explain what this was. This was a program published in 1996 by a man named Josh Clark in the very early days of the internet. And it was designed to showcase how you could go from living a sedentary lifestyle on the couch to running a 5K in a relatively short period of time. It gained tremendous traction, and even now, nearly 30 years later, goodness gracious, it's inspiring hundreds of thousands of people. Endemic to the title of his program is an important lesson. Start where you are. So many people have started their fitness journey by watching footage of Arnold pumping iron or seeing The Rock posting on Instagram, and they think that that's what they need to do. And while it's great to be inspired by these behemoths of the industry and these people who really, really push themselves, they're not you. And if you attempt to hold yourself to the standard that these people set, you will fail. Is David Goggins a massive source of inspiration? Absolutely. But are you a failure if you can't immediately bring his level of intensity and dedication? Absolutely not. You can always start where you are. And you can always strive to do a little bit more tomorrow. But if you're truly just getting started, or if you're starting to feel very worn down, or if you have an injury, you can't undo pushing yourself too hard today. 
that will only set you back. But you can do what you can do right now and show up again tomorrow ready to go. Number seven, almost everything you see online is worthless. We'll talk about who you can actually follow. This one is pretty self-explanatory, but just to flesh out the details a little bit more, there is so much misinformation on the internet. There's so many people who claim to be natty and they're not. There's so many people that are just hucksters and snake oil salesmen who are trying to make a dollar off of people's insecurity. And so the vast majority of what you see just really can't be relied on. So if you actually want evidence-based results and evidence-based protocols, as well as maybe some inspiration and honesty around some of the more nefarious topics in the fitness industry, and some good vibes. These are some people that I would recommend are actually worth checking out. Jeff Nippard, Dr. Mike Isretail, Jordan Peters, Matt Jansen, Ben Pikulski, even though he's gone a little bit off the deep end for me in recent years, Dr. Lane Norton, Chris Bumstead, Sam Solick, and Mind Pump Media. These are all great resources and they're resources that I wish I would have had starting out. Number eight, consistency trumps intensity. There's a reason that the tortoise and the hare is such a ubiquitous cautionary tale. And we all say things like slow down to speed up, or slow is smooth and smooth is fast. And then we proceed to kick and scream and throw a tantrum and call ourselves failures when our sprint pace doesn't carry us the marathon distance. Effectively, everything that we want to achieve in fitness happens on the scale of months or years. Having the perfect routine with maximal intensity that you hit every single day is a lofty and beautiful goal to aspire to. But if you can only follow it for a week and then you're so sore that you fall off and don't set foot back in the gym for three months, it's not helping you. So to use one of my favorite quotes, and now that you don't have to be perfect, you can be good. It's far more important that you show up time and time again and put the reps in day after day than it is to just show up and apply maximum intensity once and then give up. Once you've got consistency nailed, feel free to sprinkle in intensity. Number nine, after consistency, the next most important thing is exercise execution. This is something that beginner lifters, especially younger male ones, get wrong almost every time. We think that more weight and more reps is almost automatically a good thing, and it's not. This is just a recipe to getting hurt or embedding improper movement patterns and overtraining. The most important thing that you can learn early on and then spend the rest of your life refining is exercise execution. Learning how to take an exercise properly through a full range of motion and still being able to achieve muscular failure without cheat reps is going to go a really long way. It's maybe one of the most important skills you can learn. Learn how to actually feel what it is that you're doing and stop trying to earn validation points by just running around and hooting and hollering. Wait, wait. habits or recovering from injuries and retraining proper movement patterns all because you thought it was more important to look strong or look intense, then you're missing the point. You're only holding yourself back. Number 10, fitness is a celebration, not a punishment. So many of us view fitness as a morality thing. We use it as a means of assessing our worth and status in society. And we say things like, man, I was so good today. I had such a good workout and I ate such a good lunch. And we say things like, man, I gotta make up for this on Monday after we've had a long weekend of indulging. We look at exercise as a way of correcting the things about us that we don't like instead of a way to celebrate all of the amazing things that our bodies can do. The human body is incredible. We're designed to move. We're designed to respond to acute stressors and heal and repair and come back stronger the next day. Movement is a part of who we are and it's a part of what we evolved to do. And so movement and fitness is a celebration of all of the things that we are or want to be capable of. It's not a punishment used to try and make up for the perceived deficits in ourselves. Enjoy it. It's meant to be enjoyed and it's really not that serious. Number 11, diets are stupid. Learn to follow heuristics instead. Keto, if it fits your macros, intermittent fasting, veganism, carnivore, paleo, you name it, it's all dumb. None of them are innately superior to the other in terms of weight loss or long-term results. Most of these are also not designed to be sustainable. And as far as statistics are concerned, this isn't even my opinion, more than 90% of people who follow a diet within two years have gained back all of the weight they lost, if not more. This wreaks havoc on our self-esteem and it makes it all but impossible to succeed in the long term. So what's the alternative? You need to build and sustain habits that support your desired lifestyle, beliefs, and outcomes.
And most importantly, they need to be enjoyable, or at least relatively so, and easy enough for you to maintain over the long term. Crash diets and rigid restriction effectively never work, and they can actually create really problematic relationships with your body and with food. And this, again, it's not an opinion. We have decades of well-established research now to back this up. So instead of setting out to overhaul your entire diet or follow some particularly rigid protocol, learn to follow some baseline rules. Some of my favorite ones are to make sure that I'm having 20 to 30 grams of protein every meal, and I shoot to have 0.7 to 1 gram per pound of body weight of protein per day. I avoid, but definitely do not entirely exclude hyper palatable foods and highly refined sugars. I try to eat three to four whole food meals a day, and I avoid mindless snacking when I can. Learning how to apply general principles like this rather than trying to find some sort of rigid protocol to adhere to is going to take you so much further and allow you to sustain it for much longer. I also don't believe in or approve of cheat meals or cheat days. I just don't think that's the right way to approach these things. I believe in choosing to incorporate your favorite foods on a regular basis in a way that makes sense to you, feels good to you, and doesn't inhibit you from reaching the places that you want to go. Number 12, be multidisciplinary. So many of us pick one thing and we're like, this is our thing. Whether that's lifting weights or swimming or running or CrossFit or yoga or jujitsu, it doesn't really matter. We attach to it. And while I think having passions is important, I think also allowing the ability to naturally cycle through interests once the passion is no longer there is sometimes a helpful escape hatch to pull when fitness is starting to feel harder and harder. I've taken entire years off of lifting weights, but I've never ever stopped with fitness. Whether I decided to pick up running for a while or get really into jujitsu or dabble into yoga, I've always found a way to make sure that I keep this as a really important part of my daily life. And it's okay to feel like the thing that you used to love is no longer scratching the same itch that it used to. It actually might allow you to breathe some fresh life into it to take some time away from it. I also think that cross training, I currently do jujitsu and uh, bodybuilding style lifting, particularly if one of your interests is more cardiovascularly focused and one of your other interests is more resistance training focused, can actually be extremely effective. And while it may prevent you from achieving optimal results, quote unquote, in either category, it allows you to keep things spicy and move things around a little bit more freely and keep your interest level high. It also makes you a much more well-rounded individual physically and mentally. I think I lost count, definitely lost count. So next, Stop shooting all over yourself. I like this one because it's punny, but also because it's true. There's nothing that you should be doing and nowhere that you're supposed to be. You are where you are and you're doing what you can do. So stop telling yourself what you should or shouldn't be doing all of the time. Shoulds only create guilt and shame and resentment over the long term. And they engender a belief of failure before we ever really give ourselves a chance to succeed. So instead of saying, man, I really should go to the gym today, or man, I really shouldn't have had that dessert last night, say, you know what? I don't really feel like going to the gym today, but I'm gonna choose to do it anyway because it's important to me. Or, you know, knowing what I know now, I probably wouldn't have had that extra slice of cake last night, but now I know better for next time. Stop guilt tripping and gaslighting yourself and give yourself back the power to decide and choose your own outcomes. Empower yourself through your words instead of shaming yourself through them. It's going to go so much further. Apply the wisdom of Tomo Fujita. If you happen to play guitar like I do and don't know who Tomo is, you've probably been living under a rock for most of your life. If you don't know, he's one of the most renowned guitar instructors in the world. He was John Mayer's professor at Berkeley and continues to lead a massive online community of guitar learners. He's great and I highly recommend you check him out even if you're not a musician because his wisdom can be applied anywhere in life and that's what we're gonna talk about about right now. Don't worry, don't compare, don't expect too fast. Be kind to yourself. So many of us think that we need to beat ourselves into submission and become masters of our subconscious. We judge ourselves for not being where we think we're supposed to be and we continue to should all over ourselves. And we look at other people and we think that somehow they're doing better than us all of the time. Let that go, let it all go. Let yourself be where you are and celebrate each step that you take each day to get just that 1% better than you were the day before. That's going to take you so much further over the long term and it's going to cultivate a much healthier relationship with yourself, which is by far the most important relationship in your life. If you aren't gaining weight, you're not eating enough, period. Now I've tried to steer away from concrete beliefs and black and white statements over the course of this video because I think 
pretty much everything is nuanced, but this is one that's just cut and dry. And it's something that I really wish I would have understood better as a teenager. Because you do hear this a lot from teenagers looking to bulk up or the quote unquote hard gainer who just can't seem to add the level of mass that they wanna have. It doesn't matter how much you think you're eating. It doesn't matter if you're eating 4,000 calories a day and you're stuffed to the gills. If you're training sufficiently hard and not gaining weight, you are not eating enough, period. End of story, full stop. There's no other way around this. There's no shortcuts, there's no supplements. You just need to eat more. And metabolisms are always N of one and what works for other people might not work for you and that might not feel fair. It's not fair, it's not distributed equally just like the rest of your genetics are, are not. And also it doesn't matter. Suck it up, buttercup. And finally, the gym is meant to make your life better, not worse. This one should be obvious, and yet somehow it isn't. If you hate lifting weights in a gym alone, try CrossFit or group fitness class. And if you don't like that, then give a spin class a shot or go to yoga. If you don't like that, try running. I think so many of us have preconceived notions of what fitness is supposed to be or what we should look like. And we force ourselves to engage in behaviors that we don't find enjoyable for outcomes that we think we're supposed to want. So there's no one size fits all solution. Do I believe that resistance training is generally an important aspect of having a healthy body and mind, especially as you get older? Absolutely. Do I believe that incorporating something that helps with your cardiovascular fitness helps also with having a strong body and mind as you get older? Absolutely. Do I think that there's only one right way to pursue either of those? Absolutely not. And do I think there's a, an optimal way to pursue those things? It depends on what your goals are. So let yourself fall in love with the type of fitness that you love. The one that makes it easy for you to show up over the long haul. It's okay if that doesn't initially lead to the outcomes that you think you're supposed to get. And we're chasing feelings not outcomes, remember? So if you've made it this far, thank you. And I know there was a lot of information or opinions and advice in here. So I hope that at least one of these lessons is helpful to you and helps you address maybe a concern or a roadblock that you've run into on your fitness journey. Which of these jumped out to you? Are there any that you've already learned or that you wish you would have learned earlier? Again, let me know in the comments. And if you did like this video, if you got something from these lessons or you'd like to see more fitness-based content from me since I haven't tended to talk about this, let me know and make sure you hit that subscribe button because that is the single best way you can let me know that I'm on the right track. So with that, till next time, folks.